Welcome everyone to North Bay Healthcare's Doc Talk Live. We're so glad to have you with us today. Few, few logistics. Hopefully by now you've seen a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And then you'll see at the bottom, there's a um, couple tabs you can check on. There's ask a question. You can put in your questions there. Dr. Patari will take all the questions at the end. You can also put them in the chat box and we'll make sure to get to your questions at the end of the presentation. Hopefully we won't have any technical issues, but if we do, we sure ask for your patience. With that, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about Dr. Neil Patari. Being able to see his patients return to a healthy, active lifestyle as quickly as possible is the goal and the greatest satisfaction for Dr. Neil Patari. His passion is sports medicine, working with athletes at all levels, including those of us who are weekend warriors of sorts, to prevent and to manage sport-related injuries. He specializes in advanced arthroscopic and minimally invasive surgery of the shoulder and knee, as well as ligament reconstruction, cartilage, restoration procedures, and fracture care, tendon repair, and joint replacement. During his medical fellowship, he has assisted in the care of several professional sports teams, including the New York Jets and New York Islanders. Dr. Patari earned his medical degree at Tufts University of Medicine after achieving a bachelor's degree in biology there. He is board certified in orthopedic surgeon and a member of the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. In his practice here at North Bay Healthcare, he sees patients of all ages and athletic abilities. Most importantly, he treats patients as though they're a member of his family. He strives to educate and involve them in the clinical process. When he's not with his patients, he spends his time with his wife and two sons enjoying the outdoors to hike, play tennis, and explore the wine country. With that, I'm going to turn off my microphone and please welcome Dr. Neil Patari. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, uh, Kelly. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here tonight. I'll be presenting on a diagnosis and treatment of common causes of shoulder pain. It's a brief outline of the talk tonight. We'll begin with shoulder anatomy. We'll talk about typical office visit and what that entails. We'll talk about common pathologies, including the signs, symptoms, diagnosis and treatment options of these various pathologies. This is a slide showing the anatomy of the shoulder joint. In the upper left-hand corner here, we have a 3D CT reconstruction showing the bony anatomy of the shoulder joint. Here we can see this is the humerus bone. Uh, this is the ball part of the ball and socket joint. This is called the proximal humerus of the humeral head. Here we have the scapula. And part of the scapula is called the glenoid, which is the cut part of the joint right through here. Over here, we have the rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff consists of four muscle tendon groups. So we have something called the teres minor, which is right here. We have the infraspinatus, which is right here. Supraspinatus is right here. And this is a view from the back of the shoulder. The view from the front of the shoulder also showed, shows us a tendon here called the subscapularis, which is right here. So the role of the rotator cuff is basically to stabilize the joint and allows one to lift and rotate their arm. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that there's something called the bursa. The bursa is a fluid-filled sac, which basically provides some lubrication and some protection of the rotator cuff so it's not rubbing on the undersurface of this bone here called the acromion. So a typical office visit is going to start with imaging studies. We always start with basic x-rays. So the x-rays will tell me basic things about the alignment. They'll tell me about the condition of the joint, if there's any type of osteoarthritis. They'll tell me if there's any bone spurs present, and they'll tell me if there's any calcification. So this is always the most basic form of uh, radiographic evaluation that we do for all of our patients. The history uh, is something, probably one of the most important parts of making the diagnosis. It's always a very detailed questions uh, we start with your age. We'll ask questions about your hand dominance, what your occupation is. Uh, if you play sports, obviously what sports you play. If you play any overhead sports, that's obviously something that's very important that we need to know. We'll ask about how your pain started. Was it an acute onset of your pain? Is this something that's been going on for months? Where does it hurt? What makes it worse? And what times of day does the pain bother you the worst? All of these things can help us 
figure out what exactly is going on before we even do a physical examination. Numbness and tingling, knowing that is very important. Uh, that can be other pathologies, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Weakness, stiffness, also very important things to know. We want to find out if this was a single traumatic episode or if this was an atraumatic episode where pain just kind of developed as time went on. If there's any history of instability or shoulder dislocation, we want to know how many times and with what type of activities. We also know if there's, we want to know if there's any type of mechanical symptoms such as locking, clicking, catching, or crepitus. And lastly, we want to know about any type of previous treatments you've had, including physical therapy, home exercise program, anti-inflammatory medications, cortisone injections, or any type of surgeries you may have had on the shoulder in the past. Location of the pain is a very important thing. Uh, as I mentioned before, we want to deduce if you have neck pain in, in instead of shoulder pain. That's a very common thing that gets sent to my office when patients have pain in their upper back, in their shoulder blade region. That actually typically is not shoulder pain. That actually is coming from neck-related pain. So if you can see here in this diagram on the right, I have various levels listed. These are various cervical levels, meaning if you have a herniated disc or any type of issues at these various levels, it can actually lead to pain, burning sensation, numbness or tingling in any of these regions right through here. So this is very important to discern as it is completely distinct from shoulder pain. And we don't want to make the mistake of thinking you have shoulder pain when it could be coming from your neck. Going on in the physical examination for the office visit, we'll do a very detailed physical examination, basically examining every single part of the shoulder. We'll look at your sternoclavicular joint. We'll palpate your entire clavicle as well as your acromioclavicular joint. The coracoid is a small extension of your scapula in the front part of your shoulder. The biceps tendon is a common uh, tendon that is inflamed that can get affected, especially in males in their, in their 50s and their 60s. Uh, the acromion can be a common place that patients will have pain. We'll also look at the scapular spine, which is along the back of the scapula. And again, we'll look at the neck, the trapezius, which is a large muscle group in your upper back region and your periscapular region, meaning all the muscles around your scapula. Again, because we want to be sure that we're uh, directly um, diagnosing you with shoulder pain and not something that is coming from your neck or other regions that could masquerade as shoulder pain. So the physical examination is also gonna entail a detailed assessment of your range of motion. We'll check your active range of motion, which is basically the patient lifting their arm up by themselves. And we'll also check passive range of motion, which is me grabbing, holding the arm uh, and putting it through various ranges of motion to assess how much degrees we have in the various planes. So if you look here, FF stands for forward flexion. That's basically how much you can bring your arm up in front of your head, uh, in front of your body reaching up for the ceiling. Abduction, that's bringing your arm out from your side. Internal rotation, the best way to test this is to reach behind your back. And I quantify it by looking at the various spinal levels that you can reach up to. And then external rotation can either be tested with your arm by your side or with your arm abducted at about 90 degrees. Next up, we have strength. This is a very important thing, obviously, that we're going to be testing for all the rotator cuff tendons. Again, the four main rotator cuff tendons we're looking at are the supraspinatus. So in the top right image, we have something called the empty can sign, and this is where we're isolating the supraspinatus muscle. The infraspinatus is the next one, and this is this picture right here. We're basically testing for external rotation. That's what the infraspinatus's main function is. It's to externally rotate the humerus. Subscapularis, there's two specific tests that we use. There's something called the liftoff test, which is this test in the bottom right-hand corner here. And then we have something called the belly press test, which is down here uh, with, this, uh, with this female right here. You can see that she has weakness. She is unable to bring this right shoulder forward. Uh, and this can signify that she has an injury to her subscapularis tendon. Uh, Terry's minor, uh, we typically don't need to check this. This is a very, rare, very rarely uh, injured tendon, uh, presents in a very particular way. Um, again, very, very rare. It shouldn't be an issue that we have to see in most of the patients. Uh, bear hug test, this is another test for subscapularis. This is also something I do in the, uh, in the office uh, in addition to the liftoff and the belly press tests. So most of the shoulder pathologies that we're going to be talking about, they're very specific to certain decades of life. This is why uh, the history is so important. And the, again, the age 
uh, is very important in deducing what types of pathologies we're really concerned about in different age groups. So in the second and third decades of life, we're typically worried about things like instability, labral pathology. We're worried about rotator cuff tendinosis and really active uh, and active females and males, especially over in athletes, such as volleyball players, uh, baseball players, tennis players, uh, and also worried about trauma, so things like clavicle fractures. In the fourth and fifth decades of life, we're worried about something called impingement syndrome. It's probably one of the most common problems I see in my office. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit later. Also common is rotator cuff tendinosis, which is an inflammation or an irritation of the rotator cuff tendon. Frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, also very common. We'll be talking about calcific tendinitis, and lastly, biceps tendinitis, which I had mentioned previously. In the sixth decade and onwards, we're typically looking at patients that have rotator cuff tears, impingement syndrome, osteoarthritis, which we'll talk about later, and I'll show you some good x-rays of what that actually is, and then proximal humerus fractures as well. So impingement syndrome, as I said before, this is the most common cause of shoulder pain that I see. Risk factors include increasing age and repetitive overhead activities during work or sports. So if you look at the picture in the bottom left here, this is a picture of a shoulder looking from the front. And again, you have something called your subacromial bursa, which is this fluid filled sac directly over the top of the rotator cuff provide some lubrication so the rotator cuff isn't rubbing against the bone here called the acromion. Over here, what you'll see is when the patient raises their arm up, the actual acromion rubs up against the subacromial bursa and then rubs up against the rotator cuff tendon. So if you have some inflammation or irritation of either the rotator cuff tendon or that bursa, that can cause a significant amount of pain uh, and dysfunction. So that's, again, one of the most common things that I will see in the office. So how does impingement syndrome present? Patients will typically complain of pain in the upper outer arm. They'll have pain with overhead activities, common activities such as putting on a coat or reaching behind their backs. They'll also complain of nighttime pain and difficulty sleeping on the affected side. So in addition to the characteristic history, the way we diagnose impingement syndrome is with two particular physical exam maneuvers. So the near test is this test right here, basically where we have the patient raise their arm up while we're stabilizing the scapula. So what this does is this actually recreates that impingement of the acromion bone onto the subacromial bursa and the rotator cuff. In the bottom right-hand corner here, we have something called the Hawkins test, and this again does the same thing it decreases the space above the rotator cuff and it impinges that bursa. So if that bursa is inflamed, these two tests typically will cause the patient pain. In addition, we'll have pain with forward flexion and internal rotation. That's a very common th thing I'll see during physical examination. Lastly, when I get x-rays, may or may not show a bone spur. This is a particular x-ray view you can see right through here called the scapular Y view. Uh, this is the actual x-ray and then the cartoon version above it. So you can see here, type. this is the front of the shoulder on the right and then the back of the shoulder here. Type one, you can see how it's nice and smooth. Type two has a slight curve right through here. So you can imagine you're decreasing the amount of space for the rotator cuff and the bursa. And then type three is a very severe bone spur where you're impinging upon the rotator cuff and the bursa, which is right in this region that I'm pointing out in this, uh, in this place right through here. So how do we treat impingement syndrome? We always start with conservative management. So the most important aspects of conservative management are physical therapy and a home exercise program. So the goals of these are to restore normal motion and they do this by stretching, stretching excuse me, and strengthening of all of the rotator cuff muscles and all of the periscapular muscles. In conjunction, we get patients started on anti-inflammatory medications. I recommend a course of icing as well as rest and activity modification. I'd say in about 80 to 85% of patients, those, three th those four things isolated will get the patients much better. Uh, in rare circumstances, we will have to give a cortisone injection. So this picture in the top right-hand corner shows a cartoon version of a, care of a cortisone injection being given. Again, this is the subacromial bursa, which I'm outlining here. And we have the rotator cuff right through here. So what we do is we give this cortisone injection in the office. It's a really quick procedure. It takes, takes about 30 seconds to a minute. 
and we inject that cortisone injection uh, material medication, which is an anti-inflammatory, directly into the bursal area. And that's gonna be decreasing the inflammation uh, in the actual rotator cuff as well as the bursa. In very, very rare circumstances for patients that have had repeated cortisone injections and they have no improvement with the conservative management, we can do an arthroscopic procedure, uh, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. So an arthroscopic procedure is done through small little uh, poke holes around the shoulder where we actually shave down that bone spur. So again, this is an image of uh, a burr here, which is shaving down that bone spur. Again, very rare that we have to do this for an isolated impingement syndrome. Next diagnosis we're gonna be talking about, uh, probably my number one operative case is a rotator cuff tear. So it's estimated that 10% of all Americans over the age of 60 have full thickness rotator cuff tears. They're largely caused by normal wear and tear, and these are the degenerative tears. There is also a subset of acute tears which are secondary to falls or shoulder dislocations. So you can see here, this is a uh, 3D, um, 3D rendering of a person's, this is a rib cage right through here, and this is the shoulder joint. Uh, if you look right through here, this is all the rotator cuff muscles coming around the proximal humor. So you can see that there's a rotator cuff tear through here. And this is the rotator cuff tear zoomed in so you can see it in more detail. So how does a rotator cuff tear present? Very similarly to impingement syndrome, actually. You're gonna have pain in the upper outer arm. You're gonna have pain with overhead activities, possibly a clicking and popping sensation, nighttime pain, difficulty sleeping on the affected side, and typically patients will also have weakness. So in addition to the characteristic history, how do we diagnose a rotator cuff tear? So most patients will have a positive near and hawking sign, which I described earlier. They'll have pain with forward flexion and internal rotation, and they'll also have weakness with muscle strength testing. All of these patients in my practice will end up getting an MRI if I'm concerned about a rotator cuff tear. So MRI really is the gold standard test uh, to diagnose a rotator cuff tear. If you look down in this picture, this is a this is a MRI image, just one single cut of an MRI image. Again, this is the shoulder joint. Here we have the humeral head or the ball part of the joint. This is the glenoid or the socket part. This is the rotator cuff that I'm outlining right through here. So the rotator cuff muscle starts here. As you move along, it transitioned into the muscular tendinous area and then it transitions fully into the tendon. So you can see that this rotator cuff is completely normal as it comes down and attaches down into the bone which is this area is specifically called the greater tuberosity. This MRI, on the other hand, you can see that their rotator muscle, rotator cuff muscle is intact. As you follow the tendon, however, there's an abrupt stop to the tendon and you see fluid in the place where the rotator cuff tendon should be. And you can see that there's a discontinuity, which means that there's a rotator cuff tear because the edge of the tendon normally it should be here is all the way over here now. So treatment of rotator cuff tears. Non-operative treatment entails physical therapy and home exercises, anti-inflammatory medications, activity modification, and icing. Cortisone injections are only done in my practice if surgery is not an option. The reason for this is because there's been several large studies out there which have shown that cortisone injections given for a patient that likely will need surgery can actually increase your rate of needing a revision procedure. And they think this is the case because it can actually deteriorate the quality of the tendon so it can affect the healing of the tendon. So if there's anybody in there, any patient in their 50s, 60s, um, that we're pretty sure is going to end up needing surgery, I actually will only do the conservative management that's listed above, and I'll avoid cortisone injections in these patients. If we have patients in their 70s um, or in their 80s where they're probably not going to undergo surgery, I'm much more likely to be okay with giving a cortisone injection to those patients. The other times that I will utilize cortisone injections is in some partial thickness rotator cuff tears. So treatment for rotator cuff tears. Again, like I mentioned, this is the most common surgery I do. Uh, the picture here in the top left-hand corner uh, shows you what arthroscopic surgery is. So it's done by little small poke holes all around the shoulder. Uh, you can see here, this is an actual picture from the OR. This instrument right here is called an arthroscope, and this is the light source that is coming in. So this has the light source as well as the camera. So this shows us what's going on in the joint. 
this right here is the fluid source. So the way that we create space in the joint is by uh, pressurizing fluid into the joint to blow up the space so that way we can uh, see adequately. And this right through here, this is one of the portals that we make to put instruments into the shoulder and to actually perform the rotator cuff repair. The image down in the bottom left is an image of a rotator cuff tear. So you can see a pretty small to medium sized tear here. This would be classified as a crescent shaped tear coming all the way around through here. So again, this is the edge of the rotator cuff tendon that needs to be brought back down to the bone in this region. So this is before surgery. And then once all the sutures have been placed and tied down, this is what you're left with afterwards. So you can see that this is a nice repair where the rotator cuff tendon has been pulled back down over the bone. And you can see the nice compression of the rotator cuff with this crisscross um, suture configuration that we have here. This is a video, uh, not a personal video, but a video I have uh, found off the internet just to kind of run through uh, what a rotator cuff tear involves. Um, so I was going to play that for you and then narrate that as we go along. So this is a right shoulder looking from essentially the side right now. So again, this area right through here is the rotator cuff tear. That instrument is called a grasper. And what's going on right now is we're grasping the tissue to assess its mobility to make sure that it's actually repairable. So once that assertion is made, assertion is made, we basically put in a burr to roughen up the surface. We wanna create a bony bleeding surface to aid in the healing. Next up, what we'll do is we'll put in some heavy duty sutures through the rotator cuff tendon that you can see here. So we're pulling that suture all the way through. And then what happens is we retrieve those same suture ports, those two heavy duty sutures through what's called our working portal. Next up, this is called a punch. So this is made to make a guide hole for the future suture anchor in the bone. Then the sutures are placed through this anchor and the anchor is put into that previously created pilot hole. And we apply tension to the sutures to bring that rotator cuff back down to the bone, as you can see. And then the suture anchor is screwed down into the bone to hold the tendon in place while it heals. So next up, we're going to talk about glenohumeral osteoarthritis. So in 2011, more than 50 million people in the U.S. reported being diagnosed with some form of arthritis. Osteoarthritis is the wearing away of cartilage or the smooth outer covering present in joints. Causes are multifactorial, including age, genetics, repeated stress on the joint, potentially post-traumatic, and as well obesity. Obesity typically applies more for uh, the hip joint and the knee joint because obviously you're putting weight on that on a daily basis. So this is just a little diagram of what arthritis potentially would look like. You can see that there's a little thinning of the cartilage here. There's osteophytes and bone spurs all around the edges of the joint, which typically form. How does glenohumeral osteoarthritis present? So patients will typically have pain with range of motion. They'll have stiffness, they'll have clicking and locking. They'll have nighttime pain, limited range of motion, weakness, and difficulty sleeping on the affected side. So in addition to the characteristic history, Patients will typically have tenderness to palpation diffusely about the shoulder. They'll have crepitus with range of motion, and crepitus is something that can be felt uh, as a crunching in the joint, and it also sometimes can be heard if it's really bad. Pain with and or limited range of motion. Weakness secondary to pain or secondary to a rotator cuff tear, which is also present. And you'll have x-rays which show a degenerative joint disease. So again, this is an x-ray of shoulder osteoarthritis. So you can see right through here, you should see a little bit of a space here, uh, your joint space, but you can see that there's a complete loss of joint space here. And the bone of the glenoid is completely touching the bone of the humeral head. So you have complete joint space narrowing. Down here, you have a large osteophyte. So this is, this is primary glenohumeral osteoarthritis. What are your treatment options for glenohumeral osteoarthritis? So we again start with the most basic of all things. We start with rest and activity modification, physical therapy and home exercises, and try icing and anti-inflammatories. We can also try a fluoroscopic guided cortisone injection. And the reason I do a fluoroscopic guided cortisone injection specifically for this diagnosis 
is for patients with very severe arthritis, it can be difficult to make sure that the medication, uh, the anti-inflammatory medication of cortisone is actually making its way directly into the joint. So for anyone with very severe glenohumeral osteoarthritis, I'll commonly send them to get this procedure done under fluoroscopic guidance. If patients have continued pain with conservative management to the point where it's bothering them and waking them up at night, affecting their activities of daily living, uh, there are very good surgical options, just like if you can get your knee replaced and you can get your hip replaced. We can also do shoulder replacements. So there's two different types of shoulder replacements. We can either do something called a TSA, which is a total shoulder replacement, which is in this image right here where the ball is replaced with the ball and the cup is replaced with the cup. And then we can also do something called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, which is in this image where the ball is replaced with the cup, as you can see here, and then the cup is actually replaced with the ball. So the time when you would do what's called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty or this procedure is when the patient has an incompetent rotator cuff. If, they're rot if they have a massive rotator cuff um, where they aren't uh, gonna be functioning, this particular implant, the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is specifically designed to be able to allow patients to regain some of their range of motion. Um, what I've been doing most recently for the last few years I've been using a lot of planning software, which has been great um, in terms of getting accurate placement of the guide. So the way we do this is we get a CT scan, a 3D CT scan, um, as you can see here, and then we also get an MRI to assess the rotator cuff. So this is a patient of mine that I'll be operating on hopefully in the next few months, um, assuming we'll be able to do elective cases uh, in the next few months here with the virus. Uh, but this is, a, this, is uh, this patient's particular actual 3D CT scan. You can see here, this is one of the components that I insert into the joint. And the great thing about this CT planning software is that I can, I can plan the surgery out ahead of time. Um, I can put the screws and I can put the plate exactly where I want to in the best quality bone. And what they'll do is they'll actually, the company will send me uh, these 3D guides right through here. So once I get the exposure of the glenoid during surgery, I'm able to put this guide onto the actual glenoid and all of my screw trajectories have already been planned out by me previously, so I know I'm in the accurate planes and I've got the best positioning for all of my implants. Next up, we'll be talking about adhesive capsulitis, um, commonly known as frozen shoulder. So this usually affects patients aged 40 to 60 years old, women more commonly than men. Risk factors include diabetes, immobilization for a prolonged amount of time, and hypothyroidism. So if you look through here, all joints have a covering called a capsule. So if you look through here, this would be a normal patient. And in here, you can see that the capsule is really red and inflamed and thickened. And then this is actually an image from inside, an arthroscopic image from inside the shoulder joint. This is normal. You can see how there's nice white structures. This is um, one of the rotator cuff tendons here. This is one of the ligaments, well, the middle glenohumeral ligament uh, right through here. And then this is a shoulder with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. So you can see it's really thick. There's a lot of synovitis. All that red is inflammation within the joint. So that's typically what it'll look like inside the shoulder joint for this diagnosis. So what is it exactly? It's an inflammatory process that leads to thickening of the capsule and adhesion. So everything basically scars down. There's three typical stages for frozen shoulder. There's the freezing or the painful stage. There's the frozen stage in which the shoulder gets very, very stiff. And then there's the thawing phase. So in addition to the characteristic history again, a diagnosis is made if the patient says their shoulder just feels stuck. If they have pain diffusely about the shoulder, their active range of motion and their passive range of motion are painful and limited. Again, in the later stages, it'll present with a rigid block to range of motion. In this particular diagnosis, it can be confirmed with MRI, but it's not definitively needed for the diagnosis. Usually it's a clinical diagnosis um, is, how it's a, is how I make the diagnosis. So treatment options. The cortisone injection in my practice is one of the most important things uh, to getting patients better. It can, it can make patients really, you know, it can make a big difference in their treatment in the matter of, in the matter of weeks. So uh, the way the cortisone works is it's going to decrease the significant amount of inflammation and it's going to allow them to do all of their home exercises, do their physical therapy, 
Um, they still have to put in the work of doing all the stretching exercises because keep in mind there's a lot of adhesions that I said like like as I said before that form and there's also a lot of thickening of the capsule which needs to be stretched out. So uh, I will typically treat these patients with a cortisone injection the first time I see them in the office. We'll get them into therapy and I'll give them home exercises. I typically will teach them a bunch of exercises that they can do and give them a handout for a bunch of exercises that they can start doing right away. Uh, very rarely do we need to do surgery on these patients. Um, in patients that just don't get better with an injection and with physical therapy or a home exercise program, we can do something called an arthroscopic lysis of adhesion. So what that means is it'd be an arthroscopic procedure, again, with those small little incisions. We go into the shoulder joint and we basically debride out, cut all those adhesions, all that scar tissue that is formed. And then we do something called a manipulation under anesthesia where we forcefully take the shoulder and we put it through all the different ranges of motion to make sure that before we leave the operating room, we've regained as much as we can of the patient's range of motion. Last up today, we're going to be talking about calcific tendonitis. So this is a calcification that usually appears within the rotator cuff, and most commonly this happens in the supraspinatus. Typically affects patients aged 30 to 60 years old. It's more common in women. Risk factors include diabetes and hypothyroidism. Uh, and there's really an unknown etiology. People um, really don't know why this comes about. So in addition to the character, characteristic history, these patients are typically very, very painful. Um, you know, they, they barely move the shoulder, can't sleep on that side. It's affecting all of their activities of daily living. They have very decreased range of motion, secondary to pain. They have decreased strength, secondary to pain. Uh, it's a very easy diagnosis to make. As soon as you see the x-ray, you'll see a big calcification, as you can see here, which I've marked out in the arrow. And again, this is typically in, it's typically right within the supraspinatus uh, tendon. So how do we treat calcific tendonitis? Again, we start with non-operative management, it starts with anti-inflammatories, physical therapy and home exercises, and then also, much like uh, the previous diagnosis, the adhesive capsulitis, I'll always give these patients a cortisone injection uh, because in my hands that seems to do the best and gets them better as quickly as possible. Uh, in rare circumstances, again, if patients have continued pain after a cortisone injection and after they've had all the full gamut of non-operative management, there are different options. There's something called a ultrasound guided needle lavage, which means that under ultrasound guidance, we can put a needle into the piece of calcium and we can try and withdraw the kind of loose uh, calcium fragments. Or we can do something called a barbitage where we literally take the needle and we press into the calcification numerous times so we can break up that calcification. And if we do that, we would give a cortisone injection at the same time. The other option is an arthroscopic decompression where it'd be actual surgery, again, with pinholes. We identify the fragment of calcium. You can see this is from an arthroscopic procedure. Here you can see the actual piece of calcium, which has been removed from the rotator cuff. Uh, one of the issues with doing this arthroscopically, if the other procedures fail, uh, is that routinely in taking this piece of calcium out of the rotator cuff, you end up creating a little defect in the rotator cuff um, or a rotator cuff tear and you have to repair that. Um, so that would be um, the normal recovery for a rotator cuff tear. So obviously we want to focus on the non-operative treatment and then the ultrasound guided needle lavage and barbitage before we get to arthroscopic decompression as our last option. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. If you have any shoulder-related or musculoskeletal issues, I'd be happy to help. Um, I do make availability for same-day and next-day appointments. Uh, this, is my, this is my office number, and I know Kelly is going to be uh, having a link if uh, anyone would like to see me in the office. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for their, for their time. I'm going to switch screens here and see if we can take any questions, if anyone has any. Okay. All right, can do we have any questions from anyone? Now would be the time to either um, put your question in the chat box or in the ask a question. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Patari. Sure, my pleasure. I'm not seeing anybody typing. I'll just give a commentary. So I, um, I don't think you talked about bursitis in the shoulder, did you? You talked about frozen oh, shoulder. I, I did. So bursitis is a is a synonym for the impingement syndrome. So subacromial bursitis, subdeltoid bursitis, and impingement syndrome all denote the same diagnosis. So impingement syndrome is a kind of uh, umbrella term for all of these other subacromial um, bursitis, subdeltoid bursitis. So um, that's what bursitis is, the uh, impingement syndrome. Again, the most common problem shoulder issue that I that I see in the office. I will say I learned I really like uh, cortisone after that diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one question from Elizabeth. She asks, yeah. my pain goes down my arm and has resulted in tingling in the hand. Is this normal? So again, um, I don't know if you were present, Elizabeth, for the beginning of the talk. Um, anytime you have a patient that's complaining about pain radiating down the arm into the hand and numbness or tingling anywhere in the arm, that's one of the things where I start worrying about your neck because typically shoulder pathology should not lead to pain that's radiating down the arm into the fingers and causing any type of numbness or tingling in the fingers. So uh, it sounds, you know, obviously without evaluating the office, um, those type of things generally, like I said, are probably coming more from neck pathology than they are from shoulder pathology. Good question, Elizabeth. Any other questions? How long, um, Grace asks, how long will the healing process take? Sure, so I'm assuming you're um, speaking about rotator cuff tears. So uh, generally speaking, rotator cuff tears, you're looking at about six weeks in a sling. Um, and that really depends. Sometimes we'll do four weeks if it's a smaller tear. Um, range of motion exercises depending on, you know, depends on a few things, depends on the quality of the tissue, depends on the patient age, depends on if they have any factors such as smoking or diabetes, which could re decrease their ability to heal. Um, we generally start range of motion around six weeks. So we start with something called passive range of motion. Passive range of motion is where the therapist or the patient themselves will gently raise the arm up. The next phase would be something called active assisted range of motion where the patient and the therapist will actually grab the operated arm, raise it up slightly, and they'll still help themselves out using the other arm, the normal arm. And that will transition lastly to something called active range of motion. So where you're actually raising the arm up by yourself. Um, once we're through those stages, that usually brings us to about the 12 week mark. Um, so at the 12 week mark, usually the rotator cuff has enough healing that we can start some resistance exercises. Um, so resistance exercises will be a lot of band strengthening, um, low weight, um, lightweight um, exercises that you know they go over with the therapist and I would teach you exercises in the office as well. Full recovery for a rotator cuff tear, you're looking at about six to nine months. Even with that, most, most people will say that you'll get full, full recovery in a year, meaning you'll figure out where your shoulder lies at about a year. Even from after nine months, you'll get some progressive improvement in your strength and your range of motion. But generally, for the most part, you're probably like 90 to 95% back to normal. I would say within six to nine months. Great. Um, Stanley asks, can any of the shoulder problems come from, I'm sorry, can any of the shoulder problems cause shaking when writing? Um, that's a good question. You know, typically, typically not. Um, that's more of a neurologic uh, related type of issue. That's not something I hear um, my shoulder patients are relating to, you know, I suppose if you have any type of like muscle fatigue that's causing muscle spasms, I suppose that could lead to shaking. But uh, if you're having, you know, true shaking, that's, that's a completely other differential diagnosis. And that's something I would speak to your primary care doctor about, because it's not something typically I would see for any of the shoulder pathologies um, that we talked about today or any, any other shoulder pathologies for that matter. Okay. Um, a question from Jerry. He, he says, I have both shoulders involved and it seems to move from one to the other in severity. Many of the symptoms you mentioned about range of motion apply to me, but before I come in, what might I be doing to ease the pain? I've used aspirin cream and Tylenol with little effect and I am in my low 80s and have always been active and this is recent in the last couple of months. So the most basic things that you can do uh, before you come in, 
Um, you can always take some anti-inflammatory medications. Um, icing is a really important part, right? You want to decrease the inflammation to both the shoulder joints. So large bag of crushed ice, 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off. You can do that five or six times every night. Um, activity modification. So obviously you want to avoid anything that's bothering it. If you can, reaching up high, um, those type of things, because a lot of these, a lot of these bursitis and rotator cuff tendinosis, et cetera, they're just overuse injuries, right? Where the actual structure itself is inflamed and you just need to give them time to calm down. Uh, the other option that you have before you come in is uh, if you have access to the internet, which obviously if you're on this, you, you do, you could just type in, um, type in a simple thing in Google or Yahoo about shoulder exercises. Um, and that way you can kind of go through some basic exercises that you can get started with before you come in and see me in the office. Great. Elizabeth asks a question, how does shoulder pain um, have, or I guess that what is the correlation between shoulder pain and carpal tunnel syndrome? Uh, you know, I don't think there's any direct correlation per se. You know, carpal tunnel syndrome um, is obviously it's a diagnosis of your wrist where uh, the sheath that goes over your median nerve um, can be affected, can be tight, and that can lead to numbness and tingling in your thumb, your index finger, and part of your uh, middle finger and part of your ring finger. So there's no there's no real direct uh, correlation between the two. There are sometimes correlations between neck pathology and carpal tunnel syndrome, meaning if you have a herniated disc at the same level as the nerves that would be supplying your median nerve, sometimes you can uh, affect a certain nerve at two levels, meaning you could affect the median nerve at the level of the wrist, and then you can affect those same nerve roots that form the median nerve at the level of the neck. Um, but there's no direct correlation between carpal tunnel syndrome uh, and shoulder pain per se. Great, thank you, Dr. Patari. Great, you guys have been a very good active group. Are, do we have any more questions? I don't see any more on the chat or under ask a question. All right. Again, if you want um, Dr. Patari's office to contact you to discuss a possible appointment, you can email me at events, plural, at northbay.org, or you can also contact Dr. Patari's office at 646-5599. The right phone number, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 707-646-5599. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Patari, for all your time to uh, make this uh, virtual no event happen and um and we got our video to work which is even better thank you all for participating and um visit our website to see our upcoming other events that'll be the end of this presentation and we hope you all stay safe mask up and be well thank you thank you have a good night you too